Oh my God, look how many of them are coming out. Wow, it's just frightening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mind blowing actually, absolutely mind blowing. This attempted cash in transit occurred on the southbound of the N3. They are now participating in cash in transit haste. There was a loud ban and there was money everywhere. The army people as well are found into that. Kick it one with a gun. Yeah, they all there. We are following a lead on the outstanding suspects. Very, very heavy um, police presence. They're coming in, in SUVs. Look there, they got yeah. an SUV. The cash in transit is uncontrollable. Why? An epidemic has gripped South Africa. An unstoppable tsunami of cash in transit heists. And it seems not much can be done about it. Boxburg, Ekuruleni, Thursday morning, 17th of May, 2018. A group of at least 10 suspects bombs two cash vans. The brazen heist sends security guards and bystanders alike fleeing for their lives. But it's another huge payday and the robbers escape with bootloads full of cash. I was doing my daily job, ne, selling here on the street. I was standing next to the robot, next to the robot. At first, I hear the gunshot. There was a loud bang. After all, we ran away for for, for our lives. When the things happened, I was not aware of what happened, but I saw what happens. There was gunshot everywhere. I ran to cover for my life. After all, I saw there was three cars here. There was uh, two BMWs and uh, a Land Rover, a white one, this Discovery. Yeah. After, after I saw, I mean, after I hear those gunshots, I tried to hide myself by looking what is happening. Ne? I saw the gun, I saw the guys throwing the, the board. I don't know, I don't know what is what you call it, it's a bomb or grenade. I saw when one of the guys ne, threw inside. Where did they throw it? Hmm? It was the van. yes, they throw it inside the van. Ne. I was looking at them. After all, the loud bank happens. After three minutes again, another loud bank happens. Lana Fetu Gabu Rotra Imoto Imad Sabonatina Discovery for M Shop and Magvula Robot Tina it is a Sizomala Robot Malvali Robot Sangena Stang Selaban to Abafunis in Jesus Petter. So let it savory for. I am a man fully robot, 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 um, my colleague and myself, we were actually we were actually selling one of these properties. You can actually see the bullet holes. Then we just heard da 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 da. It was horrifying. It was really scary. Cora and I stopped the car. Uh, we reversed, and um, then we heard this loud explosion. What we saw, we saw a guy with an AK-47, I believe it was, but he was at, the, at these robots over here, and he was just shooting, but not shooting directly at the car. He was randomly shooting. He, people were ducking and diving, and and then afterwards, and then a uh, car came spinning out there, and we actually saw it overturn. I, I believe it was a Mercedes. Every, everybody was just running, everybody was screaming. It was really terrifying. Um, 
and then we just saw cash fly, uh, flying all over the road and oh, it was just a horrifying experience. I came here at, at about past seven. That thing happens maybe maybe one hour or two after I've started, you see. Yeah, I'll say so. And is this the first time it's happening? Here in Atlas, it is the first time, my man. I've got many years sitting here. That thing, it was the first that I saw. And I was very scared to see that thing. Upumea my security, I too. Apuma Balega, as I saw. Yabo. Elinia, Lalgo, Hokanya, Ubona, Luting at Selsai, Yabo. Elinia, Pambi, Lige, Lizzo to Julia Long up. We were just far too scared and um, he was just shooting all over. We didn't know from which direction it was. It was chaos. It was absolutely chaos. And then we heard the explosion, which was wow. It was just frightening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mind blowing actually. Absolutely mind blowing. When we come back, ne, there was money everywhere. Along this way. Yeah, along there, there, but there, 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 next to that car, ne. There was a loud bang and there was money everywhere. So there was a lot of people at that time. The people tried to, to go to that man, but the policemen were too fast to there. We've tried to we've tried to to go to that man. We know money was yeah. Everyone wants money, but the police <laughs> the police was very quick too. Yeah. But I think most of the police there, they took mining. The Hawks manage to swoop on several suspects. They recover some cash, vehicles and weapons. This is nothing more than terror. We are now having an onslaught. The latest figures from Fabric, 152 CIT robberies this year alone. Let me give you some quick trends that I've established. Most of the robberies take place on a Monday. Well, why? It's obvious. Monday pickups, a lot of cash from the weekend. Followed by Tuesdays, which are very popular days, and Saturdays, which are also very popular days for these criminals. Sunday is obviously very, very quiet. So they also need their days off, I would imagine. <laughs> we, what we are dealing with here is possibly, in my view, a few big syndicates with a few splinter groups. The very worrying factor is that very few arrests have been made. Cash is a critical and an important component of our economy. And the cash and transit industry is a critical and important service provider to the national distribution of cash. It's so important that if threatened, brought to a stop, we run the risk of bringing the whole economy to, us, to, to a stop. Cash and transit crime is not, there's no, it's, it's grist to the mall. There's a lot of conspiracies around cash and transit crime. This <laughs> political issue that you've arrested, raised, the fact that, you know, the old, the old issue was that MK was involved. It's very simple. It's easy access to large amounts of cash. And um, that's what drives it and the way to stop it is to make it a higher risk endeavor. If you look at cash and transit, for example, you have different roles. Um, you have, I will use an example of a driver. If a person has great driving skills, they can be recruited by any group of gang to drive for them. So you can have bank robbers recruiting a person who's driving for cash and transit robberies. Like for example, if a person is good with guns, then this person will basically be used as um, one of the terms that I refer to, you also see in the book, um, the person is called a Madubula. Madubula is Zulu basically meaning that this person shoots. Then this person, the skill will be utilized to shoot the cash bag. So who is behind these cash in transit heists? The gangs strike with military precision. They have automatic weapons and explosives. Check into those investigating officers in the SIU, the most corrupt institution. Corruption has moved into the hawks now. And they are not only corrupt, the hawks. They are now participating in cash in transit haste. The army people as well are found into that. There is a general degeneration in South Africa under your leadership. 
The cash in transit is uncontrollable. Why? Because you are weak, you are not firm, and criminals don't like weak people. There, are, there is police involvement. There's a lot of uh, there are a lot of examples of where policemen were either are either brought in as part of the gangs to assist with, for instance, driving getaway vehicles or driving the loot away from the scene, or helping to run interference after a crime, or uh, provide information. So we know that there there is police involvement on that level. We also know from uh, the discussions and the research that's been done with people inside prison who have been put away for this crime, that they often pay off police officers to um, make a docket disappear or to remove evidence from a docket so that they, their case won't go to court. So there's a lot of involvement on that level. We know that. Um, we must be very careful to say that this crime is driven by the by police complicity, it's most certainly not. It's driven by sophisticated criminals, but there is complicity of police officers um, on many levels. When I interviewed um, the guys in the prison, they said that it's very easy to, to get guns. We might think that it's difficult for them, they said it's very easy. And I actually, when I was preparing, I listed from my dissertation some of the places that they said you can get the guns from. Yeah, so they basically said that they disarmed the police officers, um, they disarmed the security officers, and they buy from former MK members, so they bought their weapons from them, and then they buy from Zimbabweans, um, they buy from the police officers, which is very worrying, and also talks to the issue of corruption and police officers being involved in cash and trusted robberies, which is something I also mentioned in my research because there is a police officer that I interviewed who was in prison who was actually involved in cash and trusted robberies and he got caught. So this guy, basically what he did is that he was an off-ramp, so I speak about an off-ramp in my research, which is basically um, a person who drives a getaway vehicle that's not at the crime scene but stops a few meters, kilometers away from the um, crime scene, then these guys get off the getaway vehicle from the crime scene and turn to the off-ramp and in most instances they were actually using police vehicles to get away to, uh, as an off-ramp. So then the police officer admitted that his job uh, in, in the cash and transit robbery gang was to protect their weapons and to also get away with the money so that if the guys are stopped somewhere else and they don't have any evidence on them. So the police officers, they do buy from them as well. Allegations are flying faster than pieces of an exploding security van. Could those sworn to protect and serve actually be involved? We, we can point fingers at the police. Um, their hands are also tied. They, they're short of resources. We know they have a plan of action which they hope they will implement, but this is no quick fix solution. I think we need a multifaceted approach. We need the public to come on board. And I, I appeal to the robbers, con continue posting on Facebook. The issue of inside information also needs to be tackled because uh, most of them, uh, it was actually 35 robbers who said that there is no way that you can um, rob a cash van if you don't have inside information. So they do have fingermen, they have people pointing them in the right direction coming from either the bank or the security company. The success of their robbery is dependent on what the Sangoma can see. So basically you go to a Sangoma, the Sangoma looks at the way or they throw bones or they do whatever that is done there, I don't know what is done. Um, then the Sangoma can tell them, listen, um, this robbery is going to be successful based on one, two, three, four. Or the Sangoma can also tell them, okay, you cannot hit this time around, so you have to postpone this job because things are going to go wrong. So they also um, believe that the muti, because the Sangoma will also give them muti, the muti that the, the Sangoma um, gives them makes them um, in, invisible, it makes them invincible, gives them some kind of like supernatural power or strength, and it makes them fearless. How then can the cash heist epidemic ever be stopped? You must take a firm stand and say, the day you produce an AK-47 against the police and the security, you will meet your, may, your maker. 
because as government we will have ceased to recognize your rights the day you take AK-47 on innocent people. Because our people are dying, the security is dying, the police who are honorable are dying. They don't get a firm support from your leadership. Cash and transit crime has always been done with military precision. It's always been the standout element of cash and transit has always been how good they are at doing this, how good these criminals are. We know they are the criminals who are at the top of the food chain. They talk about themselves as professionals, as, as this being a crime of prestige. So these aren't normal criminals. These are the top level criminals. The skills that are required there would, would be the, the, what we refer to as the modern day organized crime syndicated um, setup is that you'd have particular skills, whether it be with f firearms, whether it be with explosives, whether it be with, with vehicle driving, those are the skills that are recruited. And once the, that particular um, crime has been committed, they go their separate ways, obviously after splitting, splitting the cash. Um, I refer to the same thing with regard to the use of firearms. Um, there are experts or skilled people in that, in that regard that are utilized. And, and so you see these perpetrators aren't restricted to a particular area they would cross provincial borders for that matter, um, any provincial border to commit these crimes. And that's how the skills are, 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 are employed and deployed. We have a multidisciplinary approach on this matter regarding our investigations and we are working with other law enforcement agencies uh, including crime intelligence whereby each and every information that comes into our attention we act on it and just like last night you know we were very proactive that four suspects were arrested in queenswood while they were still planning so we were very proactive that the information we received led us to a very successful arrest of four suspects which were arrested in queenswood in uh, around pretoria there, there is a lot of uh, backup support we're deploying helicopters so there are um, tactical teams additional de deployed but currently it's a new modus operandi that they're using. And, and remember that the vehicles hasn't been built to protect them from bombing. They were built to, to protect them from uh, people shooting at them, etc. So that, that is currently a problem. But the industry and ourselves are looking at solutions to, to implement technology to assist us with this. But also we need the, the support of the SAPS to, to assist us with it. Through our investigation so far, we have recovered about 95 million rands, the stolen motor vehicles as well as rifles and pistols uh, from the crime scenes. And we've also recovered bulletproof vests, police radio as well as jammers. And that is a success. Security companies G4S and SBV declined to comment on camera. The security guards now hope that a strike would highlight their plight. The most critical thing is that the, the workers feel that they are being used as cheap labor and for them to express themselves in a protest action because currently on average they are receiving something like 11,000 rand per month and many of them have lost their lives and they feel that that wages is way too low for the risk that goes along with that work and therefore they are putting a demand forward where they want to earn a salary of 20,000 rand per month but going with that they want the company to train them so that they can do their work better but also there must be sufficient amount of people on the trucks. To give you, for instance, an example, when they drop off money at the shopping center mall, they find themselves walking with a 38 special and a, a cash money in the other hand. And the criminal can be in the crowd with the AK-47. So if that criminal wants to take the money away from them, they are totally exposed. And a, a matchup between the AK-47 and the 38 special you can obviously know who's going to win. And that is the reason why we feel that the companies must equip our members with the right caliber of firearms and to also make sure that they are supported with people that will be with them when they drop off money in shopping center malls. G4S has been the hardest hit. Uh, I'm still surprised that G4S is in business because with the number of vehicles being bombed, I'm not talking of the cross pavement ones, I'm told that a lot of their vehicles now have to do double or triple runs, which means they're getting more cash. 
I've even had retailers coming to me to say, you know what, the companies haven't picked up money today because uh, possibly they're out of vehicles. So I think we need to confront the brutal facts. I see the unions have correctly so jumped onto the bandwagon to ask everything about whether the guards are properly armed, whether the working conditions are okay, whether they are adequately paid, danger pay, etc. And I think the unions need to put pressure on the CIT companies to get their act together. We had, we had this particular problem in the past. Um, in 2006, we had major problems with this particular industry. And what we found at those days, there was a working together between government, business and labour. And you would recall during those days, in the centre of Johannesburg, a baby was shot dead while the baby was carried on his mother's back. And, and that spurred the parties on. And we managed to bring the cash and transit incidents down to almost zero because the police was working with business and with labor. And we managed to apprehend these people. And what we find now, um, if we can work together again like we did in the past, we will be able to deal with this problem very easily because we need the government to be committed, business to be committed, and labor to be there. I think there is the political will. The political will, I think, is informed by the fact that South Africans are becoming more and more aware of this and that South Africans are in a way becoming quite outraged by it. That will back the political world to do something. When people speak, when people become involved in something like this, the politicians will listen. So I'm hoping that this, what I see as quite a civic outrage around these people <coughs> taking these, this, this crime right into the hearts of our cities and towns and, and highways, I'm hoping that's going to give the politicians the necessary backbone to actually say we need to do something. And once we do that, we can normalize the situation because you must remember our members transport in the region of about 10 billion rand per day. And our ATMs need to be filled up every day. And if we don't collect the money from the businesses, you can imagine how much cash money will be stacking up and then the Reserve Bank has to print more money because the money doesn't flow properly. So if the government doesn't listen to us, we will, from our side, embark on a longer strike. Because it's quite important that we must respect our members in the cash and transit industry and that we must also pay them a proper salary. This cash and transit house, I feel sorry for the people who actually drive the vehicles. Um, they don't get paid that much money and they put their lives in danger every single day. And my heart actually goes out to these poor, poor gentlemen. As the saying goes, crime doesn't pay. Meanwhile, cash heist criminals continue laughing all the way to the bank. Well, basically, people want cash. So in the beginning, the robbers said that they were in need of money. They wanted money because they wanted to fend for their families. Uh, but then as they proceed or as they persist, in, in, in committing these robberies, then it's not about money anymore, it's about greed. So then the need um, basically now grows to greed because you can also see, I think recently with, with the security guard who was um, arrested, you could see on his Facebook page, um, him posting with um, flashy cars and he was wearing only uh, basically flashy clothes, labels. And so they persist in committing the robberies because they need to maintain this lavish lifestyle. I saw a video of somebody counting allegedly 3 million rand on Facebook. Yes. Um, we need more of that so we can get these, uh, I want to use the word, but so we can get these, uh, uh, I'll use it, the bastards arrested. Because at the end of the day, they are ruining the economy, they are taking lives, they are putting people, ordinary citizens' lives at risk. And I think we as citizens have to take a stand. Enough is enough. And I think the, the public has a role to play because it's somebody's family member, it's somebody's neighbor, it's somebody's colleague, it's somebody's friend, somebody in your community. We need to blow the whistle. Someone, somewhere, somehow knows who's involved with these, with these gangs, who's involved in crime, and we need to break our silence. It's not only about getting rewards. We must make it our moral and our civic duty to get, to get uh, uh, these people behind bars. And I think the, the cash industry, the cash transit industry, have a pivotal role to play. Investing money in investigation, in making sure they use technology, in updating their vehicles, 
in making sure that guards are adequately trained and can fire back. I mean, how does a guy, a G4S guard with a 9mm pistol, fight a guy with an AK-47 or permission explosives? It doesn't make sense. But it is difficult if you've got two or three people that going against 15 or if a group of 15 or 20 people. It's very difficult. Can we improve? Yes, I definitely think we, we're busy with deploying and doing more uh, tactical training with our teams. And uh, I think the technology on our vehicles and the way that, that, that they, they've been developed is, is a very, very adequate, not for bombings, but to protect our staff and, and people. I don't honestly believe that the socio-economic the problem that we have in this country, which is a very real problem, is the principal driver behind this. Yeah. All of the evidence that we see suggests very strongly, proves very strongly, that we are talking about greed and we're talking about organized criminal syndication. I'm sure that, I'm sure that there are minor theft and there's theft going on and there's stuff going on that, that one can attribute to socio-economic demand and desire because there's so many people in this country that have nothing. But it's it's not it's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is real greed based crime. Only a few people in the society are committing crimes. So if you look at it, if you look at like, look at the cash and transit robbers or, or robberies for example, then that means that there is a high possibility, like I said, they do not stop committing crime. So, and in the research that I conducted, most of them have been arrested multiple times. So they get arrested, they go to jail, they serve whatever sentence that they served, they go outside, they continue committing crime. So you can say that it is somewhat the same people. Obviously new groups get formed as well, but the same people can also be arrested for the same type of crime because they do not desist from committing crime. We appeal with the public out there that if they may find themselves in a position where they would like to take a video, you know, of the visuals as the incident is happening, they must consider their safety first. And everybody who think maybe they can reach out to take a few thousands from the crime scene, that we are dealing with very dangerous and, and greedy criminals that they do not mind, you know, they do not care who, to eliminate anybody who is on their way of them getting what they want. That your safety comes first, be in a position where you care more about your safety than, you know, losing your life in pursuit of getting a few thousands of getting or, or getting, you know, that two minutes of fame that you are the, the first person to break the news out there to the world. Your safety comes first.